Hello. Good morning, one and all present here. I wish you all a very happy International Human <coughs> Rights Day, 2021. Uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor and the Chief Patron of International Conference, Professor Sanjay Singh, sir, he will join soon. The Chief Guest of International Conference, Professor S. K. Bhitnagar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Ramanur Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. The keynote speaker, Professor Antonetta Elia, University of Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Guest of Honor, Dr. Saslina Kamaruddin, Associate Professor, Sultan Idris, Education University, Malaysia. The Director of the Conference, Professor Prithamishra, Head Department of Human Rights and Dean School of Legal Studies, Baba Sahib Imran Ambedkar University, Lucknow. The Patron of the Conference, Professor Prithi Saxena, Director, CPGLS School of Legal Studies, Baba Sahib Imran Ambedkar University, Lucknow. The Organizing Secretary of the Conference, Dr. Shashi Kumar, Associate Professor, Department of Human Rights, the School of Legal Studies, Baba Sahib Bhimra Ambedkar University, Lucknow, and all the deans of various schools, heads of the departments, respected faculty members of VBAU and other educational institutions, research scholars, their students, UT viewers, and all those who are present in this virtual international conference. I, Rashid Adhar, Assistant Professor, Department of Human Rights, VBAU, <coughs> on my personal behalf, and on behalf of the organizing team, welcome you all in this online international conference organized by Department of Human Rights School of Legal Studies, BBAU, commencing on 10th December 2021, that is today, on the theme of Advancement of Human Rights in 21st Century, to commemorate International Human Rights Day, which is observed on 10th December every year across the globe, because in 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UDHR is a milestone document that proclaims rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of their race, color, religion, sex, language, political ideas, nationality, origin, and birth. It is believed that December 10th is an opportunity to reaffirm the importance of human rights in rebuilding the world we want to live in, the need for global solidarity, as well as our interconnectedness and shared humanity. With the hope that the conference will be successful in achieving its objectives and sensitizing enough the people across the nations to respect and observe human rights. Now, I invite Professor Pritha Mishra, Head Department of Human Rights and Dean School of Legal Studies, BBAU, and the Director of the conference for presenting a formal welcome address. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Rashida. A very, very good morning to all of you <clears throat> and a great Human Rights Day today. Uh, Human Rights Day is marked every year on 10th of December to commemorate the day when the United Nations in General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Since 1948, the UDHR has stood as a beacon and a standard for a better world and has dominated human rights thinking world over. This 10th of December every year reaffirms the fundamental commitments of the UDHR. It proposes ways in which these commitments can be carried forward to meet new challenges for the advancement of human rights. International days and weeks are occasions to educate the public on issues of concern, to mobilize political will and resources to address global problems and to celebrate and reinforce achievements of the humanity. The UDHR is a milestone document which proclaims the inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, language, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. This year's Human Rights Day theme relates to equality, reducing inequalities, advancing human rights. And slogan for this year is all human, all equal. The principles of equality and non-discrimination are at the heart of human rights. Equality is aligned with the 2030 agenda and with the United Nations approach set out in the document shared framework on leaving no one behind. This includes addressing and finding solutions for deep-rooted forms of discrimination that have affected the most vulnerable sections of society, including women and girls, sexual minorities, religious minorities, indigenous people, migrants, and people with disabilities, among others. <clears throat> Equality, inclusion, and non-discrimination 
a human right based approach to development is the best way to reduce inequalities and resume our path towards advancement of human rights in 21st century realizing the 2030 agenda today we need to review and revitalize our efforts to realize the rights articulated in the declaration due to enormous global change increasing refugee crisis the increasing threat of terrorism violence against different kinds of minorities and horrendous abuse and sufferings of women and children in conflict situations and in other situations in order to deliberate on the issues of advancement of human rights in 21st century today we have with us very eminent personalities from the academic world first of all i heartily welcome professor sk bhatnagar sir honorable vice chancellor of dr ramanohar lohia national law university lucknow as chief guest of this international conference i am delighted to share that sir has also been associated with our department of human rights as senior professor for a very long time before adorning the seat of vice chancellor of rmnlu i welcome and thank you sir for uh, accepting our invitation and for being the chief guest of the program <coughs> I am sure participants of this conference will be blessed with your vast experience in the field of human rights. So, with great pleasure, once again, sir, I invite you to, to this international conference. It is nothing like coming to the home again, sir. I feel extremely happy to welcome our today's keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Antonita Elia, Senior Associate Fellow in Law, University of Santiago de Compostela, Spain a nominee to the Global Leadership Prize 2021. She has vast experience of visiting various countries for seminar conferences and for supporting and mentoring students around the world. She is a distinguished professor of international law and human rights. With all the participants, I am looking forward to your keynote address, ma'am. I am sure your address will justify the theme of the conference. I welcome you, ma'am, in this online conference and hope to see you in near future face to face too. So welcome you, ma'am. From the core of my heart, I welcome our special guest, Dr. Saslina Kamaruddin, Associate Professor, Sultan Idris Education University, Malaysia. I am sure with her research interest and rich experience in criminal justice, money laundering and terrorism financing, artificial intelligence law and mental health law, she will enrich the knowledge of our participants. Regarding advancement of human rights, I thank you and welcome ma'am for sparing your time and for giving your consent for this special address as well as for giving your consent for chairing the technical session of the conference. Uh, I welcome you Saslina to this international conference. I welcome the chief patron of international conference, Professor Sanjay Singh Ji, our honorable vice chancellor of Baba Sahib Bhimra Ambedkar University, Lucknow. He has always been a source of courage and strength and has always supported our academic endeavors. It is only because of his blessings and guidance we feel motivated to organize such events. With all indebtedness, we welcome you, sir, in this conference. I know he is busy, he is not here with us, but he has assigned the task of a presidential a remark to Professor Victor Babu, who is a senior professor of our university from the Department of History, and presently he is in charge of history uh, Presently, he is in charge of the registrar of the university also. Uh, uh, in a little while, he will, Victor Babu will be joining soon this conference. So, in advance, I welcome and thank him for presiding over this conference, who in spite of a busy schedule as a registrar and other academic responsibilities, he has consented to preside over the session of this uh, seminar. So, I welcome to this conference, Victor Babu, sir. I welcome patron of international conference, our senior faculty member, of Department of Human Rights, Professor Saksin, Preeti Saxena, Madam, who is also Director of Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, BBAU. She has always been a pillar of strength in motivating and supporting all the activities of the department. From the core of my heart, I welcome you, ma'am. Without participant, any event has no meaning. I welcome all the participants who have spared their time and given us, given us encouragement to organize this international conference. Here I would like to thank especially uh, Ajay Banwal from Banaras Hindu Law University who acquainted us with the guest of our program. And I 
I welcome all the faculty members from various parts of India. I have seen the registration forms from all over India. Uh, many faculty members and students have joined this international conference. So from uh, the deep sense of gratitude and acknowledgement, I welcome you all uh, to this international conference. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee of online international conference, on behalf of university fraternity, I welcome one and all for deliberations and enriching ourselves with new thoughts delivered by academicians and scholars coming from different parts of India and across the globe too. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for welcoming our distinguished, distinguished guest and all the participants here. Now, we all agree that the equality, inclusion, and non-discrimination is the only best way to advance human rights. So with this, now I invite Dr. Shashi Kumar, the Organizing Secretary of International Conference and the Associate Professor of Department of Human Rights, School of Legal Studies, BBAU, for introducing the theme of International Conference. So, okay. Thank you, Rashida. First of all, at the outset, I welcome our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Anthonita Elia and uh, um, Dr. Cecilia Kamodin for joining from abroad here in this international conference. And let me introduce the theme of this conference. As Madam has already told that this is a human rights day, and it's my my greetings to all of you. Uh, international Human Rights Day. Let's prosper and fight for rights. We respect our rights. And for this, this year's the UN uh, International Human Rights theme is equality, reducing inequalities and advancing human rights. And for this reason, the advancing human rights we have taken as the, our conference theme also. So we, when we looking back to the, when the UDHR was adopted by your nation, <coughs> the 73 years back, when we uh, we will uh, evaluate the functioning of your nation and uh, the uh, how the UDHR has inspired many of the international constitutions of the world. Many countries have adopted this. This uh, this uh, have inspired by the uh, this UDHR, and they incorporated the the principle, the article, the rights in their fundamental rights in the constitutions. And India too. In India also, we have incorporated the basic human rights in our fundamental rights in our constitution. And in the preamble also, we have uh, mentioned the liberty, equality, justice, fraternity as the basic principles of democracy, which India is trying to develop. India is a uh, great democratic country. And since tradition, we are following the uh, democracy and human rights. But now if we see the, the 73 years of UDHR adoption, we find that the United Nation has um, advanced, has innovated many rights. May, there are many conventions, declaration, on many rights of the vulnerable people, apart, see, UDHR was, <laughs> UDHR is just a inspirational document, but given the its enforcement, uh, legal enforcement, you can say that ICCPR and uh, ICCR, these conventions have given uh, in the effect to this UDHR, and after that, many uh, conventions on the right to child, right to, of, of women, uh, of the disabled people, and there are some many rights that have been, uh, have been inaugurated, like, and there are, to see, there are some issues also uh, in the, uh, which new issues have come up, challenges have come up, if you see, and uh, there are, I want to say that, like climate change, climate change is a very big problem nowadays, and I'm happy that Antonita Elia, she is working in this area of, of this um, uh, climate change. And I will hope she will speak on this issue also, how this is affecting the human rights of the people. Because climate change is also affecting our basic human rights. Then we have a global terrorism. This is a very threat to the uh, uh, our, our national security also, global security and the peace of the world. So one global terrorism is one area which is very much crucial for us and whole world is 
uh, fighting for this uh, and debating on the different forum. And recently, um, uh, like uh, Al Qaeda or the, there are many states that we already witnessed the 9/11 in America. How this uh, global terrorism has uh, has t- turned the world in a different shape. And now we also have a uh, now uh, the world is facing the health crisis, COVID pandemic. COVID pandemic for last two years it has changed the whole. Uh, you can say the geopolitical, the 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 forum of the world differently. Now we are meeting internet, uh, inter uh, communication, and uh, through internet we are meeting. Conferences are held in, through internet. So all, our travel, our trade, our economy, our inter- whole thing is not disturbed. It's affected by pandemic, and it, it is and. Um, even city general also Antonio Guterres has told that this is a very challenging time and this time we have to stand together to fight the pandemic the problem of the pandemic and the whole world and the state has the it also the, it has urged he has urged the state to um, the state has responsibility to protect the basic right in this crisis also in the health crisis it's a duty of the state it's most of the state whole uh, government of the whole countries to uh, protect the human rights of the and also apart from there there are many issues like corruption the statelessness migration migration problem these are the new issues and challenges before now before the world leaders uh, in this uh, and i think you did, and uh, i was reading that uh, just in, uh, in this october only the un human council has uh, has um, recognized the right to clean healthy environment as a human right recently so all these challenges has to be tackled with the with the all this and uh, i think this conference and we have a very eminent personality here one from the malaysia and one from the italy both will give the, uh, the view world view from the their perspectives and i am also welcoming all the delegates and my uh, our chief guest also professor ski patnagar for joining this program thank you thank you all thank you sir there has rightly remarked that a stand up together and make a collective effort is the only way out to remove the challenges in the way of realization full realization of human rights so thank you sir for introducing the theme of the international conference now i invite professor respected priti saxena ma'am the patron of the conference and director of center of post graduate legal studies school of legal studies and the senior professor of the department of human rights bbau for sharing her views on the theme ma'am please thank you so much dr rashida Uh, good morning to the chief guest of the program, Professor S. K. Patnagar, sir, Vice Chancellor in LU, Lucknow. Uh, very warm morning to the keynote speaker, Professor Antonita Elia from University of Santiago de Compostela, Spain. And good afternoon to the special guest, uh, Dr. Sasalina Kamaruddin from Sultan Idris Education University, Malaysia. Uh, good morning to all uh, our Indian participants, guests, colleagues. students uh, scholars and uh, the organizers uh, from uh, our department for this international conference professor priti mishra professor shashi kumar and dr rashida athar uh, the conference on advancement of uh, human rights in 21st century so first of all i must congratulate you all on this auspicious day that is the international human rights day Uh, the theme as uh, has already been told is for the year equality equality that has to reduce the inequalities and that has to advance the human rights so uh, this is a human right based approach to development a way that is to achieve not only equality but leads to the inclusion and non discrimination now in 21st century the theme is equality now with this reference to equality just a week ago uh, you see that the bjp uh, member from, from kerala that is uh, kj alphonse 
he moved the motion in the upper house to amend the preamble to the constitution of india we all know that's the supreme law of the land why to introduce uh, some of the words and to replace some of the words in the preamble to the constitution of india and uh, that bill of 2021 that seeks to replace <laughs> the word socialist with the word equitable in the preamble and it also seeks to change the words equality of status and of opportunity to equality of status and of opportunity to to be born to be fed to be educated educated to get the job and to be treated with dignity the 20th century declaration uh, we are commemorating today and every year we are here to discuss on the human rights in 21st century so talking of equality reducing inequalities advancing human rights in 21st century and uh, that is uh, the first quarter is uh, about to complete in just 3 to 3 years the amendment proposal seeks the rights like education food work and dignity so we need to introspect how we can achieve equality and why we couldn't till now <clears throat> further uh, this bill also proposes uh, adding access to information technology and happiness as the objectives so to me uh, it seems that uh, this century is uh, for emerging technologies and technological solutions to like uh, blockchain artificial intelligence and machine learning and these are the growing areas uh, which have also some effects on our human rights we need to advance ourselves in these areas to enjoy the different rights with the help of technology uh, just like uh, you see that uh, we use so many gadgets uh, be it a laptop uh, smartphones smart watches and so many other things which we are using because these has been developed through the technologies in which we upgrade the softwares we need to upgrade our human rights too to meet the challenges of this century our 20th century written declared human rights need constant updating updating to keep the pace with time updating to come up and to meet the challenges of the modern time and our human rights law that can be applied in changing circumstances so this century human rights are technological environmental and cooperative the 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 rapid development of science and technology has had a remarkable impact on the human rights and uh, it can be witnessed uh, that scientific technologies that have been developed through different industrial revolutions also i'm not going into detail because i want to listen the speakers from abroad but they are growing with rapid pace we all know this thing and uh, you see that the universal declaration of human rights which speaks about everyone's right that everyone has a right uh, to share the scientific advancements and its benefits so we should think uh, of the human rights uh, like uh, to have the free broadband uh, uh, to have the free internet the human rights to the technological information we should think of the human rights to technological development uh, we should think of because of this covid scenario what we are we are following observing now the human right to online education the human right against the forced choices uh, which every user of the technology faces through artificial intelligence we are just forced to if we are, if you are uh, clicking one of the item then that types of the information you will be getting always uh, when you are using any of your uh, gadget so uh, the human right against these forced choices of the others uh, which uh, every user of the technology we are facing like uh, the human rights to participate in the e governance the the human rights against the use of those technologies uh, which are polluting environment uh, both physically and mentally uh, 
then uh, we can also think of the human rights uh, to justice it's not only access to justice it's uh, justice is a very vast term so we can think uh, in respect to the technology in respect to the environment in respect of the cooperative society in respect of the other social uh, cultural and uh, educational and political scenario also in that respect we can think of the human right to justice to participate more and more and uh, many more rights we can think of which are uh, required and which are uh, required not only to be included incorporated but to be upgraded which we couldn't exercise due to the pandemic as we were not prepared for so the rights which are existing in this udhr and other international in instruments those are also required to be upgraded so to as so as to meet the challenges of 21st century so i think that human rights need to be upgraded they are to be advanced to meet the emerging ch changes and challenges both and uh, therefore uh, i think that uh, the topic which has been chosen <laughs> by the organizing committee is very apt jarbin in today's scenario when we are facing this combat covid pandemic and in that way what rights we are having what rights we could enjoy what rights we couldn't enjoy what upgradation is required what advancements are required those are the important points which need to be discussed uh, in this uh, international conference and i suppose that in the coming technical session uh, in, in this international conference the participants friends the delegates they must be this aspects uh, on the human rights and with these words i once again congratulate you all and wish a grand success of this international conference thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you for your views now friends it's a matter of pleasure for us that today we are here to listen the views of professor antonetta elia university of santiago de compostela spain and dr elia i i don't know she is having a very vast academic experience so i don't know where to start and where to stop but i will definitely try to sum up her a uh, very expanded bio data professor dr elia is a fully engaged scholar and practitioner in the field of human rights law and policy her academic and professional interest include the relationship between human rights and environment and in her academic capacity she has served as member of the mediterranean network of experts on climate change and contributed as selected lead author and main contributor contributor to the first assessment report on the impact change and environmental harms into the mediterranean mediterranean region published in november 2020 and awarded by the council of europe with the north south prize 2020 on that work she is also a member of many international cooperative projects on different subjects and served in 2019-20 as reviewer for the research agency of the republic of serbia dr elia is editorial board member of numerous internationally specialized journals and of many professional networks and international associations <coughs> in 2021 she has been appointed as senior legal, legal expert to the italian interministerial committee for the human rights her previous appointments includes a uh, visiting professor ships of international law and human rights at youth china university of political studies beijing and also many more like uh, she has been a visiting professor of international law and human rights at Inter inter american academy of human rights saltillo mexico and she has been a visiting professor of uh, international law at sgt school of law india in 2020 and also served as member of the team of professor of school for legal studies professions of university of rome italy at the same time she is external associate legal expert european asylum support office easo 2020 and also served as for council of europe and she has selected for council of europe as legal expert for european human rights standard 
implementation projects in Armenia, Turkey, and Moldova in 2018. She has also worked with United Nations in United Nations AIDS and HIV removing program. And she has also served as vice director of the International Council for Diplomacy and Dialogue in <coughs> France for, two, the, for the year 2020. She is specialized in international law, comparative constitutional law, and European law. And obviously, um, she is having many more contribution in law, in the field of law and international human rights. Like Dr. Elia delivered seminars and presentations at many international conferences in USA, European Union, China, South Korea, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Turkey, India, Argentina, Chile, and Mexico, and also mentored the student of the a student across the world. And for her academic excellence and contribution, particularly in the area of environment and human rights, she has been nominated to the global for the Global Leadership Prize in the year 2021. So now I think. We are very blessed to have you, ma'am, with us, and we are eagerly waiting towards uh, your. We are looking forward to you, co to you, looking forward for your kind words and enriching knowledge of all of us on the theme, ma'am. With this, I very humbly invite you to present your views on the theme, ma'am. Please, Professor Doctor Antoinette. Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, thank you very much. Good morning from Europe. Uh, thank you very much uh, to have me today to share views with so distinguished uh, colleagues uh, from uh, India and uh, from uh, Malaysia, from all around the world. I would like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, Professor Priti Mishra, Dean and uh, Head of the Department of Human Rights, for her kind invitation to have me today. And uh, uh, also to uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Sashi Kumar for had uh, the, the patience uh, to insist to have me uh, in such uh, in such day. Uh, it's such an important day for all of us. I would like to uh, also express my gratitude to Professor Priti Saxena, uh, Director of uh, the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies for uh, her uh, distinguished views and to uh, introduce the day uh, with her words and I had uh, I will have some comments also about your if I can about your introduction uh, which is uh, has been so inspiring uh, I would also uh, to express my gratitude and uh, say let me let me say that I'm very happy to we meet again uh, after a couple of time, uh, uh, Dr. Sazlina Kamarudin from Malaysia. Uh, I can say my distinguished fellow and friend. Uh, uh, one of uh, my advantage to uh, to be always connected has been also to e meet uh, so brilliant and. Uh, 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 distinguished colleagues, inspiring colleagues all around the world, and uh, Sazlina is between them. It's like uh, uh, Dr. Rajay Kumar for his uh, uh, to be so nice and uh, to insist also to have me today. And finally, let me uh, also to express my gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Sajjan Singh, uh, for. Uh, have me. So uh, I think that I will. I, I need a day, an entire day, to express my gratitude, and it would be still insufficient. <laughs> so uh, welcome to all uh, colleagues and uh, dear students following us today, and then uh, in the video 
records after that day. So um, I would like to start uh, saying just that I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert at all. I think that uh, I just I'm just a civil servant, someone who had the chance to uh, uh, try to uh, use um, uh, to use an, uh, knowledge to help uh, people to empower. Uh, because that's the point today. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, practical every one of my distinguished uh, fellow uh, speakers uh, previous uh, said, uh, both Professor Shashi Kumar, Professor Priti Saxena, put the accent on many relevant issues and new challenges we are living nowadays and uh, the um, possible impact that those new challenges can have over the effective enjoyment of human rights. Uh, today is the day of... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Today is the day of celebration of the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations, adopted now uh, so many years ago, exactly, on 1948. We know that from a point, uh, a legal point of view, an international legal point of view, it is not a legally binding instrument, at least formally, but substantially, yes, for states, because of that content, of its content. <coughs> and even, sorry, even if uh, um, inside you don't find reference to present challenges uh, that uh, Professor Saxena and Professor Kumar already mentioned uh, in reference, for example, new technologies, climate change, and so on, you can see that the e, interpreting the Universal Declaration is always um actual the universal declaration is always actually actual unfortunately um, perhaps we can say because uh, human rights are still under threat practically everywhere in a different way in the globe uh, but that's why we are here today joining efforts sharing view and um, uh Given, uh, given people uh, and future generation, especially uh, confidence to fight for effective uh, human rights uh, enjoyment through human rights education, because this is the basic point. Uh, the pillar, the basis for human rights uh, effectiveness is human rights education access to education first is uh, uh, one of the most important right, relevant right to me, especially for uh, young girls and uh, women, continuing learning, continuing education. So, and then mm, the, the topic uh, uh, the topic of that conference uh, uh, this year is equality and non-discrimination. Of course, without education, no equality is possible, in my view. I'm thinking from a gender perspective. If we have access, uh, if we don't have access to the same opportunity, no equality is possible. But I would like to add something more about that because uh, of course equality non discrimination is basic to reach an effective enjoyment of all human rights and of course all the major international treaties uh, both at universal and regional level mention the obligation for states to guarantee human rights uh, 
without any kind of discrimination, discrimination and in accordance with the principle of equality. But equality is only possible if at the same time another principle is respected. Equity. Formal equality, it's a point. But to reach a substantive, a substantial equality, what is important is to uh, guarantee the respect of principle of equity, of equity of uh, um, uh, of access to opportunities, because that's true. We are we are all equal because we are human beings, but we have no every we have not everyone the same access to the same opportunities. In other words, and simply speaking, when we start. Um, uh, when we, we are not at the same line of start. So the obligation of state is to put everyone on the same line, giving the opportunity to have access to the same opportunity, doting everyone uh, with the necessity, the necessarily, um, sorry, the necessary means and the instrument to reach such line. This doesn't matter, doesn't mean that uh, uh, human rights are a matter of a, give, uh, of a gift uh, by states, not at all. But uh, state have, uh, states have an obligation to put everyone in a condition to have the same access to the same opportunity. That's the kind of obligation. And that obligation has a double nature, a positive one and a negative one. The positive one means that uh, states must take all possible measures actively to realize such principle, uh, adopting laws, uh, public policies, administrative uh, documents, uh, truth, uh, judgments, and so on. But at the same time, they have also a negative obligation. And that negative obligation means that states must retain them to uh, create obstacle in the development of human beings. That's the point. Equity, to have substantive equality, because the formal one we have, practical everywhere, in every international instruments, like rightly Professor Sashi Kumar may already mentioned. And uh, with the advancement of uh, new technologies and uh, uh, the new, uh, relatively new uh, challenges, global, global challenges, uh, such uh, substantive equality uh, is uh, always, um, is increasingly uh, from one side uh, hard to be reached. Uh, because uh, in the case, for example, of uh, new technologies, uh, Professor Priti Saxena rightly mentioned the right to have access to new technologies, uh, the right to have uh, access to uh, the progress of science is contained in the International uh, Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of the UN at Article 15. This is a basic right, but at the same time, when we uh, look to the possibility to uh, guarantee equity and find uh, accountability for the lack of such of respect of such obligation, 
In the case of new technology, these, these, these risks to become a very uh, hard issue because behind an algorithm, an algorithmic technology, who is there? There is a state, there is uh, the author of the algorithm, there is the owner, there is the product producer. So you see that the, uh, the fluidity of new reality and the need, the necessity to rethink specific rule applicable to this new, um, new reality. Let me use that term. The, we, we, are, uh, we have uh, in, our, in our days, uh, especially because of uh, the pandemic. So, uh, in relation to climate change, I would like to um, uh, thank, uh, express uh, knowledge to uh, Professor Kumar to mention the, the, the uh, to, to re for his request in some way. Uh, but I think that we need uh, a, an entire module <laughs> talking about uh, possible impacts over generation of conflict. Uh, regional ones that can become uh, uh, international ones um, uh, and then threats to uh, security and stability uh, in a specific region uh, but also unfortunately globally so uh, impact of uh, uh, climate change over human rights but what I uh, would like to underline just in that and very quickly uh, are a few uh, elements uh, because climate change is a fact it's not a matter of uh, uh, just today or yesterday or uh, global conference uh, of the adoption of a treaty of Kyoto and so on about uh, about uh, uh, new rule uh, for environment. Climate change is a fact and uh, the uh, engagement of United Nations at all level uh, is uh, uh, very, uh, started a very long time. The point is that uh, how such environmental modification that, let me use that expression because environmental modification uh, include not only climate change but also environmental harms. So um, those aspects uh, are under study. The consequences, it's impossible in my view to um, reduce uh, or to categorize, better said, uh, the impact that human rights uh, receive from environmental modification, from the risk for life, so the lack of respect for the right to life, as the Human Rights Committee of United Nations uh, exactly uh, two years ago uh, affirmed condemning the state of Paraguay uh, because of uh, the violation of the right to life between all the rights uh, uh, in a case of environmental modification and recognizing the responsibility of state. I'm just giving an example, but the Human Rights Committee intervened uh, on the topic a uh, few times. Uh, uh, so in that case, especially, he recognized the responsibility of state to take all possible measures, uh, firstly, to stop the environmental modification. Secondly, to prevent future environmental impact. And third, to try to restore the previous situation in order to guarantee the habitat of the victim. 
That's really relevant, in my opinion. But before the, the, the human rights comedy, the most relevant work done in relation to human rights and climate change and uh, the definition of the right to an healthy environment um, as a, an autonomous right and the most important, fundamental to the effective enjoyment of all other rights, has been carried out at regional level by human rights jurisdiction, especially the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, I, as I said, we need a, we need an entire module only on that. But uh, just to give an example, in the case of the Inter-American system, what has been central is to uh, try to define the right to an healthy environment, uh, like a basic right, and uh, uh, from that also to try to define a right to sustainable development as an autonomous right. And uh, even though uh, the court started uh, about uh, environmental issues in relation to the rights of indigenous people in the region, so in the progress of its address, she arrived very quickly to uh, um, separate the, uh, with a very uh, interesting reasoning and uh, in uh, its advisory opinion on of 2017 uh, on uh, on uh, in, over the right on the right of an healthy environment uh, to define uh, the right uh, to sustainable development too and uh, it is a very important because it gives an, a special interpretation of Article 26 of the Convention. So uh, this is uh, one example, but also other uh, regional uh, jurisdiction of human rights uh, gave their impressive input towards uh, uh, a definition of a right to an healthy environment as an autonomous right. And as you know, uh, to the political side, not really legal side, at international level, very recently, last uh, 8 October, the Human Rights Council adopted for the first time a resolution defining the uh, right to an healthy environment as an autonomous right and calling upon all member states to take all possible measures to guarantee such a right and uh, underlining between, between other things uh, the relevance of such rights for the effective enjoyment of all rights. And for the first time, it has been created a new mandate holder in the framework of the Human Rights Council, which is the uh, special procedure, the special rapporteur on climate change. So you see that from very... Uh, in a very short way and compacted way, I, I think that I'm also over the time. I don't want to abuse of the use of microphone. So, uh, uh, and, and uh, but I would just to conclude such reference to uh, health, uh, to the right to, to the right of healthy uh, to an healthy environment, that you see that both from a legal a political side. Uh, there is a sort of convergence in such a way. When I say political, I refer not to decision maker. I refer to a uh, universal institution which exerts political control, not, ju not jurisdictional control over the implementation of human rights. In that case, is the Human Rights Council, which is also important in my view for the work it developed uh, over the year in the monitoring, implementation and advancement also of human rights law and the methodology also to reach 
new substantive agreement, new substantive normative uh, uh, issue, and uh, also new uh, impact, if I can say, over including international law of treaty. I'm doing reference on the way to uh, the new ways uh, of negotiating a new treaty in relation to human rights. For example, with the uh, use of the method of the open and lead working group, where practically every stakeholder, not only representative from states, can express their view and put their contribution to the definition of a new text in relation to a new challenge of uh, to human rights. Thinking about business and human rights, for example, uh, thinking about uh, the, the additional protocol to the uh, UN Convention on Children's Rights and so on. So uh, what I would like, and I'm going to conclude uh, to give uh, today, uh, okay, the reality sometimes look very obscure in relation to human rights effectiveness. And me, I'm the first to be said for that. And... Uh, uh, at risk of depression, as I used to say, joking about that. Uh, but we must be positive if we want to do the best for the progress of human rights, for the benefit of all, and especially in such a black period. So, of course, international cooperation is uh, uh, basic to reach uh, human rights enjoyment for all uh, but in uh, in such present time we assist to we assisted to um, I don't want to use the term crisis of multilateralism between states uh, I would like to say instability or a lack of return of return to uh, local issues or local approach to global issues. That's exactly the opposite way we need. And I think that uh, what we are doing also today, uh, all together, distinguished colleagues, is also that to join forth for the better interest of humanity and the effective implementation of human rights. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be very happy to receive your comments and views and questions uh, uh, now and then after the conference. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Ma'am has very rightly mentioned that environmental problem can be tackled through political will, legal initiatives, and individual support. Thank you, ma'am, for your very informative and thought-provoking -provo deliberation. Now, it's, uh, we are having with us Dr. Saslina Kamaruddin, Associate Professor, Sultan Idris Education University, Malaysia, as a guest of honor with us. And uh, she has, a, Dr. Saslina has a very vast academic experience in the field of uh, international human rights law with the special reference of technology and cybersecurity. She has published numerous papers in different conferences, different, different conferences, webinars, and workshops on the topic like uh, the non-criminalization of cyber stalking and its impact on justice for victims, some evidences from Malaysia, COVID-19 and its impact on share market regulation in Malaysia, a comparative study on Malaysia law reform on marriage and divorce, Act 1976, a paper on anti-money laundering law in Malaysia, the imposing penalty for internet addiction in Malaysia, the violence against women in Malaysia, the issues like cyber security, legal aid, and law's obligation has also been tackled by Madam uh, in various conferences, which also got published in a very reputed journal. Some are of uh, the, the Scopus and Web of Science journal. And besides this, ma'am has also secured a lot of grants for projects and worked as a member and principal investigator in the project like uh, 
counter terrorism use of the internet in malaysia mental health problems among school children in malaysia the privacy and data protection in artificial intelligence and technology online hate speech in malaysia other than that ma'am has also worked as on number of consultancy project and also prepared and contributed a number of uh, governmental and corporate reports for malaysia so with this ma'am now i very humbly invite you to present your views on the theme with us ma'am ma'am please Right, thank you very okay. much, uh, Dr. Rashida. I feel honored to, to share the platform of all distinguished uh, guests and also VCs and also all the <laughs> organizing committees. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. And of course, Prof. Antonita, Prof. Elia, which I've met, uh, I think, last time during AI Summer Schools, we share the same platform. Uh, right, today my team, my team of uh, with regards or in conjunction with uh, International Human Rights Day, uh, I'll be talking about the uh, a little bit on my research, definitely on the uh, artificial intelligence and also the predicaments or the challenges in, in, in upholding or securing the human rights in the age of artificial intelligence as well as data-driven world. Nowadays, we are relying heavy, heavily uh, relied on data, right? So uh, when we talk about the predicaments in protecting human rights in the age of artificial intelligence and data-centric world, I believe uh, most of the speakers earlier has actually covered the, 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 the issues of fundamental liberties, the equality, the discriminations, the rights to fair trial, all of the uh, issues re uh, uh, revolving around human rights was actually mentioned earlier by the keynotes as well as the number of professors right talking about ai everyone knows that ai is basically is a is a, a technology that has been defined in which they they are mimicking uh, they are actually replicating the human stars right basically talking about ai it has many benefits and of course ai is actually centered uh, to improve the creativity services safety lifestyle and help to solve many problems that we have nowadays right at the same time the, the tensions that we have with regards to artificial intelligence is, of course, it raises many anxieties and have adverse impacts on human autonomy, privacy, and fundamental rights, as well as it has if affected us on many freedoms, especially privacy, data protection, freedom of movement, uh, equality, mostly, and also uh, discriminations, right? And also, when we talk about AI itself, we know that uh, we have... Uh, international instruments such as UDHR has set the rights for fundamental liberties. And of course, we have this ICCPR, ICESR, all the international instruments which have laid down the needs for the country to preserve uh, human rights as well as develop technology which favours or avoid discrimination or transparent transparency and also be accountable for whatever technology they have developed. When we talk about the AI itself, itself. Uh, when we talk about AI laws and regulation, of course, we have many international instruments. At the EU level or European level, we have this GDPR, EU laws and directive which governs the artificial intelligence. At the national law, of course, we have the uh, national countries' national AI policies. And of course, uh, apart from the AI uh, national law policies, we have many uh, OECD, for example, they have come up with ethical standards and guidelines and also professional codes of conduct, right? So the, the tension between data and artificial intelligence is always revolving around the issues of human rights, privacy, fairness, governance, transparency, the accuracy of the data. many researchers, academicians, or even government reports. So whenever there is a, a, a intersections between AI and data protection, the always issues that has been triggered is always human rights, privacy, the fairness of AI, transparency of algorithms, which is main issues in which we are revolving nowadays. We don't even know how to the, the algorithm is interpreting data and the data sets that has been trained by the AI technology developers. Right, so that are among the issues. So, talking about AI and um, 
human rights principles. Uh, the first issues uh, that are centered with this AI technology is, of course, we have this lack of algorithmic transparency, right? This algorithm transparency in which we don't even know how this AI manufacturers or software developers are developing their their software and also the data that has been trained. This has actually give impact to the rights of fair trial because we know uh, if you have watched the uh, series in Netflix, they have the series of coded bias. They have uh, actually uh, shows a documentary how this fair trial process has been affected with regards to more black people are being discriminated. They are regarded more as the criminals, right? Due to the data that has been in this discriminatory in natures, right? Apart from that, we have known that uh, the lack of algorithmic, algorithmic transparency has also uh, give uh, uh, people, uh, deprive people of their effective remedies and also the access of public services as well as equalities, right? To equal treatments, okay? Another one of the issues of AI and human rights principles are the rights to cyber security vulnerabilities, unfairness, bias, and also discrimination, right? This particular rights, uh, this particular AI issues, uh, give me a minute. I think there's some network issue. Yeah, I'm sorry, I ha I'm, I'm having some technical issues, right? Uh, with regards to AI in terms of cybersecurity and its vulnerabilities and also unfairness, bias and discrimination, this has definitely um, affected the fundamental liberties with regards to rights to privacy, freedom of expression, the free flow of information or the rights of information, discrimination with regards to children, women and the persons with disabilities, and also... Uh, uh, rights to a fair trial. So, the cyber securities and vulnerabilities, unfairness, bias has lead to all these uh, fundamental liberties has been affected. And when we talk about the AI system, uh, it has always been uh, issues. Uh, we know that previously uh, the regimes of strict liability has governed AI, but now there is some issues in which there is a, a lack of contestability. That means we cannot contest the data the, or the algorithms process or the black box process, right? So that has actually impacted human rights as well, right? And uh, in terms of the legal personhood, subjecthood and moral agency, uh, the affected AI technology, uh, the affected fundamental liberties will be the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law, right to equality, eliminations of all forms of discrimination. And also, uh, the technology or the AI technology has also looked into the intellectual property issues and of course has affected to rights to property and also rights to freely participate in the cultural life of community to enjoy arts and share scientific advancements, its benefit, rights to the protections of moral materials or interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic productions if the person is the author. That is actually AI has got to do with IP issues. And also when it comes to uh, adverse effects on the workers, we can see that um, when, when AI is taking over the rights of workers, it has got uh, affected the rights to social securities, prohibition on discrimination, enjoyment to works, rights to equal pay. Equal pay is still a, a, a problem here in Malaysia. We know that men are getting higher pays or higher workers, higher um, compensation schemes compared to women. And also, privacy and data protection issues is always an uh, unresolved tension when it comes to these uh, AI technologies, right? Uh, I myself is doing a research on the how AI could be could mitigate the issues of data protection and privacy. Since we know in Malaysia that AI is still like um, far way to go because we have yet to devise our national policy on artificial intelligence, right? And also, uh, uh, as we can see now nowadays, uh, another issues of uh, centralizing or revolving around artificial intelligence will be the lack of accountability for harms. How do we define harms? Is it the manufacturers? Is it the software developers? That is another issue involving AI. So this has, uh, in a way, give 
uh, uh, affected the fundamental liberties of right to life and rights to effective remedies by the citizens. Right? In which we don't know how do we seek uh, legal uh, discourse. Right? So when we talk about this, um, uh, we are mapping these legal issues to the vulnerabilities. Like I said earlier, the lack of algorithm transparency will give uh, people people are denied job. They are refused loans. Many many people have since we have seen many reported news that people uh, teachers are not getting their pension schemes. People are denied job because of the, the systems are screening your CV. Those things, right? And also, in terms of the cyber securities and vulnerabilities, of course, we can see that the the reliance and dependence of AI enabled technologies has actually when we rely more on technologies. The more we are dis uh, disclosing our data, the more vulnerable we are, right? As we can see, I think uh, quite a moment ago, uh, maybe uh, quite some times ago, Facebook was shut down, I think, right? So the, the highest reliance of us on the data is actually making us more vulnerable. And of course, when we talk about this unfairness, bias and discrimination, AI, uh, there is widely reported news when it comes to these uh, AI uh, discriminations, right? Right, uh, and also, uh, how do we tackle the issues of lack of algorithm transparency? There was a pressure at the international levels to design and govern AI to be more accountable, fair, and transparency. Right, there are various policy policy options to govern algorithm transparency and accountability. So, at the international level, they are proposing to actually look into the algorithm impact assessment and also algorithm transparency standards are needed, which are really needed at the international level and later on could be adopted to the local law, right? And also, when we talk about the uh, data protection and privacy, bear in mind that Malaysia uh, privacy has never been mentioned uh, expressly in any status in Malaysia, but we do have that impliedly in right to life under Article 5, right? When we talk about the AI uh, issues and human rights, we can see that the uh, machine learning is part of a subset of AI. They can reduce the both accountabilities of the owners and the contestability of their decision, right? When there is a machine learning, uh, the decisions of machine learning, a lack of contestability, then we cannot challenge or prove any discriminatory results, okay? All right. Also, um, like I said earlier, the deployment and the use of AI can actually cause the damage to persons and property. We have seen uh, the AI or driverless car or self-driving cars has crossed, crashed and killed someone, right? So in terms of that, is strict liability still uh, relevant for us to govern, right? And also, we have looked into, uh, uh, when it comes to discrimination, we know the another LGBTQ uh, is actually affected uh, community. Uh, another another person which are always discriminated by these AI technologies, right? So, what are the way forward for us to actually preserve human rights and also, at the same time, promote healthy or uh, transparent and accountable AI systems, there will be a re three actions plans needed at the international and also local level, right? So first, that we should reduce the adverse impacts of AI continuous risk by having the identification, prediction, preparation with the affected stakeholders and representation of identified vulnerable. This should be done at the early stages of the research or designing the AI software itself. Basically, the action one, we are talking about the reducing adverse impact. These particular actions are directed to all the actors in the AI ecosystem. For example, we have researchers, research funders, developers, deployers, users, policymakers. Reduce by, uh, in order for us to reduce by having conducting risk assessment, all the stakeholders should be involved. Number two, we have to develop and build capacities of vulnerable communities for resilience to such effects. We know that those who are, in terms uh, in Malaysia, we don't go for black black people because they are not really degrading. But in, in other countries, we have seen many Black Lives Matters, all those campaigns. But in Malaysia, we go on the races maybe, right? So those are actually uh, uh, points for us to ponder in terms of eliminating the discriminations. And the third one, of course, when we talk about, sorry, the second one, when we talk about the developing and build capacities 
for the uh, for for the communities to resilience of such effects this uh, should be addressed to the policy makers at the international and also national level the third one will be tackling the root cause of the vulnerabilities uh, maybe we have to go for a harder policy and regulatory stance on the harms discrimination inequality <laughs> injustice are full by such technologies. This tackling issue should be directed to the regulators at all levels. So usually, uh, develop and tackle uh, requires immediate and priority measures since actions one involving the whole ecosystem. So first of all, in order for us to mitigate the AI uh, technology impeding or uh, hampering the human rights, we have to go and develop the capacities of uh, uh, resilience to the AI, uh, AI issues and also tackle the roots caused by having strict regime or regulatory approach. Right. When we talk about the AI in Malaysia, like I said earlier, Malaysia is quite left behind in the sense that we are yet to develop our national AI policy. We haven't had that. And when we talk about the uh, data protection and also privacy, Malaysia was ranked um, uh, quite bad in the sense that among the Southeast Asia country, they have actually go for survey. Malaysia was ranked bottom five, and also they have scored uh, below uh, fourteen below this all the category access. And also uh, the reg regulatory framework in Malaysia have not covered on the data protect privacy issues created by the cookies online. Uh, online tracking, cloud computing, IoT, and also the big data. The lack of transparency is not only happening in Malaysia. I believe the whole world is actually talking about the AI transparency or big data transparency, right? Right. With that, uh, uh, the way forward for us, like I said earlier, apart from the action plan, uh, we here as the researchers will 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 make some changes by by researching and publishing. Uh, regularly on the current issue. So definitely all the multi uh, multidisciplinary efforts from all stakeholders, of course, us as the researchers, the lawmakers and policymakers, as well as everyone in the environment should take or play their roles to, to, to ensure that AI is not hampering on human rights. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for raising the very important issues like right to privacy, transparency, and lack of compatibility related to artificial intelligence. And also for suggesting the ways for reducing the risk of artificial intelligence. That was really helpful and informative lecture in the emerging areas of human rights and technology. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable time and views. Now, before inviting or introducing our chief guest, I would like to welcome our registrar, Professor Victor Babu, sir, who has just joined. We welcome you, sir. And, sir, thank you that you have spared some time from your busy schedule for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us. And uh, now our chief guest is Professor S. K. Nagar, sir, who is the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Ramano Loya National Law University, Lucknow. And it's a matter of pleasure for me to introduce you, sir, though you don't need any introduction. Our chief guest is also our mentor, as Professor Mishra mentioned about his association with the Department of Human Rights in beginning. So, sir, we are very blessed uh, to have you as our chief guest for today's program. So, sir, Professor Bhatnagar has a long teaching and administrative experience. He has completed his LLM from Prukshet University and PhD in law from Rohtak University, Haryana. He has worked in various capacities in Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar University, Lucknow. Some of the major positions he held were Dean of Law and Acting Vice Chancellor of BBAU Lucknow in 2001 and 2007. Professor Bhatnagar has served almost for four decades as law teacher in university departments. He was also the member of the first academic council of the National Law School, Bangalore, in 1987. He has been nominated by the Chief Justice of India as the member of the Executive Council of, of the Indian Law Institute in 2006. Based on his long teaching and research experience, he has contributed in many reputed institutions of national repute, like members of the academic bodies of Himachal National Law University and Assam National Law University, member of the academic bodies of universities at Delhi, AMU, Selchar, Jammu, Patna, Asansol, Bhopal, Sirsa, Nanital, Allahabad University and Karnavati University, Gujarat. Professor Bhatnagar has published around 
three dozen papers in reputed journals and edited book and he has been member of editorial and advisory board of the reputed law journal apart from these he has been invited by the all india radio to deliver several talks on legal and other issues his special interests include legal aid and legal literacy program sir we are eagerly waiting to hear you your views on the theme so please thank you very much very good morning good morning sir professor sanjay singh represented by dr victor babu or old kuli professor antonita ilia from spain dr saslina kamaruddin from malaysia professor priti saksena professor priti mishra dr shashi kumar dr rashida athar from department of human rights dr ajay baranwal and other fellow colleagues scholars and dear students the theme of this uh, conference is advancement of human rights in 21st century and incidentally we are in the 21st year of the 21st century and if anything is on our minds is covid 19 or corona or omicron for the last two years we are suffering from that and in february 2021 the un chief had declared not officially but in a formal talk that it is economic crisis it is social crisis it is human crisis and it is a human rights crisis because of this the governments have got enough powers very wide powers and one of them was to impose lockdown when lockdowns were imposed on us on right to life right to liberty right to equality right to education right to health all these rights were affected so lockdowns have affected our lives socially and politically and economically and it has ruined businesses also the only salutary or uh, i can say good impact of uh, covid 19 was on wild animals and plants during lockdown we witnessed that the wild animals uh, were very free they had come to the cities they were wandering there the birds in london started chirping again because there was no smoke on the uh, roads there was no pollution the plants uh, in many cities when they were choked because of this uh, monoxide uh, this uh, i think uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases they also started flourishing so when we are talking about human rights if you talk about rights of other species animal kingdom or plant kingdom they were better placed but what has been done by covid 19 it has affected access to health it has affected right to education you know about uh, india and in other developing countries also the schools were closed down online education has started but in india in africa and in most of the developing countries the children do did not and do not have any access to smart gadgets like smartphones or laptops or desktops so right to education was uh, affected likewise right to health was also affected because rich were in a position to get all the health facilities you know about vaccine also what drama we witnessed in last one year a new idea of uh, vaccine nationalism had started and uh, day before yesterday there was a news uh, in the newspapers that the rich countries are hoarding vaccines because they think now omni crown will also benefit them so it is not question of equality within the national boundaries it is the question of equality at the global level also and this covid 19 has exposed the structural inequalities among communities among nations also 
you have seen that how who behaved uh, some people uh, alleged that it was biased uh, it could not be proved but when we are witnessing vaccine nationalism then the question arises what should be our focus during this 21st century or during this part of the century that is 21st year of uh, 21st century we have to develop a new normal there is no doubt about that but in new normal we have to be informed by human rights when we are tackling the economic crisis or social crisis then the human rights cannot be wished away this particular fact was emphasized by un chief last year that when we tackle the human uh, this uh, covid 19 crisis the human rights should be in the center there is a conflict sometimes we say between environment and development that is climate change and development and cop 26 has also not uh, moved further because when we talk about carbon neutrality then most of the countries who are guilty of holding the vaccines are not in a mood to go further that is another thing which we are talking about and that how to have equality among the nations also so we have to develop a new normal in that new normal we have to respect the human rights we have to develop a new kind of strategy for implementing human rights uh dr kamaruddin talked about ai and data pertinent team wish you all the best thank you bye bye thank you sir thank you so much for joining thank sir thank you so much thank you so much sir we have to develop a new kind of mechanism to implement human rights in this new normal very rightly said sir so thank you it's it is always a matter of pleasure and inspiration to listen you sir thank you sir thank you for your valuable time and words sir now uh, I very humbly invite Professor S. Victor Babu, sir, the Registrar of Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar University, for his presidential remark. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Fully uh, audible. Uh, honorable, uh, honorable Professor uh, Batnagar, Vice Chancellor of uh, Law University, and then other faculty members, Dean of the school, and then other uh, participants of the seminar. Um, as I said, I'm a student of uh, history. I don't know much about. Uh, human rights but as far as uh, my knowledge goes so human rights basically talks about uh, the rights which uh, which are uh, basically must be available to all human beings right with regard to their life uh, property liberty freedom of expression irrespective of uh, sex uh, gender creed and the uh, nationality and i think uh, uh, as a discourse of uh, human rights was going on in the western uh, countries uh, our constitution was also framed in a, uh, then while framing the constitution i think most of the um, human rights have been kept in mind by the framers of the constitution and the form of fundamental rights and then uh, um, basic principles of the directive principle of uh, state policy uh, they have incorporated and uh, as uh, some um, participants have remarked uh, the jurisprudence of uh, human rights uh, has been expanding and i think uh, even after the uh, adoption of the constitution there are a lot of changes in the concept of uh, human rights right um, uh, which uh, have been taking place in the western countries and the eastern countries and then maybe i think uh, the domestic violence act which we brought to recently and forester act you know we are talking about to uh, Uh, the rights of the people who live in the forest and uh, these are the some of the issues or maybe the rights of gays for example uh, uh, rights for the same sex marriages and then uh, have been going on and then uh, the government our government has also has done something uh, about it and then uh, now uh, there is a question of uh, uh, basic human rights human dignity when we talk about human dignity making law is one thing and then implementing it is quite another so we have um, laws which have been made uh, as far as human rights are concerned for example uh, abolition of uh, untouchability act and uh, under it there are uh, you uh, you hear of incidents of uh, practice of untouchability now and then uh, in our society so 
of course human society our society has uh, evolved over the period of uh, uh, 70 years and we have achieved a lot and there is uh, there are miles to go in achieving this uh, equality and then um, freedom of expression uh, and then uh, human dignity in our society and um, uh, i think uh, uh, in the western countries now like um, what is that movement in you know, a breathe uh, i can't breathe i can't breathe this kind of uh, issues you know uh, questions of uh, ethnicity caste and then gender also have to be taken into account and i think uh, with the evolving uh, uh, thinking about uh, human rights and dignity and i think uh, a day will come in our society also when we will be able to achieve that uh, thing in our society so with these few words uh, i think uh, i congratulate uh, the organizers of this seminar and i believe the deliberations will definitely revolve around how to get uh, how to get this uh, human rights uh, applicable to all people and making these human rights available to the uh, people across uh, the nations thank you thank you sir thank you very much and before uh, offering a proposing a formal vote of thanks now i will make an announcement for all of you that immediately after the end of inaugural session the plenary session would be started and the uh, for this plenary session we are having the speakers uh, like dr bhanu pratap assistant professor faculty of law university of lucknow uh, he will be speaking on the topic of conceptual genesis of human rights under international law and dr ajay kumar banwal assistant professor faculty of law bhu varanasi will be speaking on some human rights issue and dr nk smore associate professor department of environmental science bbu lucknow will be speaking on the topic right to clean environment issues and challenges so be with us thank you now at the completion of the program it's my great privilege and privilege and honor to propose a vote of thanks in this online international conference organized by department of human rights first of all i would like to thank our honorable vice chancellor professor sanjay singh sir in his absence here as without his blessing we would not have been able to organize this he is always motivates and he always motivates and inspires us for organizing such academic activities i am also thankful to professor s victor babu sir the registrar of our university for his kind words and for his valuable time i also convey my deep sense of gratitude regards and hearty thanks to our chief guest professor k patnagar sir the honorable vice chancellor ramanur lohia national law university lucknow for accepting the invitation and spending some time with us i also convey my special and sincere thanks to our keynote speaker professor antonita elia university of santiago de compostela spain and guest of honor dr saslina kamaruddin from sultan idris education university malaysia for accepting the invitation instead of the busy schedule and giving a great insight on the theme thanks to both of you ma'am i also extend my heartfelt thanks to professor priti saxena professor priti mishra dr shashi kumar the patron director and organizing secretary of the actually the whole organizing team for organizing a conference on such an important topic thanks to all of you for your ideas motivation support guidance and presentation of intense views on the theme thanks to all of you i also appreciate the work uh, and the technical support done by mr kamruddin the office assistant department of human rights in making the conference successful i propose my special thanks to all the youtube viewers now i convey my heartfelt thanks to all the distinguished participants including students and the faculty members um, please forgive me if i i am failing to take the name of the faculty members some of the names i can take here like dr uh, nk smore sir dr bhanu pratap dr ajay kumar banwal and all the respected faculty members i thank you all i consider that their presence in the major is the major contributing factor towards the successful completion of this yes. i hope that this conference would be served as a small but a significant step to achieve the goal of udhr which is universal declaration of human rights with this once again thank you all thank you very much and happy international human rights day oh. over to thank dr shank dr thank you very much thank you for the seminar so well and once again also thank all the participants of seminar our special guest chief guest and vector babu sir for presiding over this session i thank you all thank you so much for a patient here thank you all thank you thank you very much bye bye thank you very much bye bye see you next time thank you very much sure ma'am sure ma yeah thank you very much what to dr shashi kumar ah uh, yes 
thank you all for this amazing session now we will commence the preview session and we have a uh, training session for this uh, in which we will have invited lecture by our faculty from our institute also from the university so in this training session the chair will by the table will be by the doctor sushila tamogin assistant professor in malaysia she will chairing this session madam i welcome you all right thank you thank you dr sashi uh, you have to uh, control the mic <laughs> command the mic have to and all right okay and uh, And, uh, are we starting the uh, technical session now? Yeah, yeah. Just this. We are going to start. Right. Right. Hi. No, Assalamualaikum. Is the plenary session first? Plenary session. The special session lectures first. will be here. After that, <laughs> technical session for okay. paper presentation will start. After that, this is the first is the plenary session yeah. where we are having the three panelists: Dr. Bhanu Pratap, Dr. N K Smore Sir, and Dr. Jagmar Banwa. then after that there will be a technical session will be chairing by dr uh, saslina kamrudin and you will be the co-chair of that and will be conducted by uh, mr prashant or phd scholar research scholar okay okay so now in this uh, training session we have a, i think two or three speakers bhanu yes. bhanu and the more is present here no banwal is also here and banwal banu pratap dr n k s moor and dr ajay kumar right banwal yes 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 ma'am yes, yes. Uh, three of them so for, uh, i think we give time is now short so we'll give 10 minutes time for each of you 10 to 10 minutes maximum 10 minutes so please let me start from uh, dr banwal pratap he is our alumni and We are in my um, he is faculty of law, uh, faculty in the University of Lucknow, faculty of teaching law. Manu, please. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my sincere uh, thanks to Professor Dr. P. T. Mishra, Professor Dr. P. T. Saxena, ma'am, uh, Professor Shashi Kumar, and uh, Dr. Rashida Atha, ma'am, for inviting me and giving me this prestigious opportunity to express my view on this auspicious day of uh, International Human Rights Day. Um, the topic of my discussion is the conceptual analysis of uh, human rights. So, in this brief discussion of mine, uh, I'll be focusing on the idea as to what were the reasons for the rise of uh, human rights in the context of international law. in a nutshell i'll be focusing on the ontology of uh, human rights now uh, whenever we talk or discuss about the origins of uh, human rights or the way the idea is coming from uh, we usually associate the idea of human rights with natural law philosophy or we tend to uh, parlay about human rights in philosophical terms now in in my discussion i'll try and uh, focus on the idea as to how human rights it developed in the in the context of international law and apart from the natural law philosophy were there any political social conditions that were responsible for the development of human rights and contrary to the popular belief i'll try and share my views as to whether legal positivism played any idea played any role in the development of human uh, rights and we'll also see why is it that we tend to view uh, the idea or very concept of human rights through the lens of western legal tradition so what were those conditions that allowed western uh, legal uh, jurisprudence to dominate the narrative of uh, human rights now uh, as far as the concept of human rights is concerned uh, human rights is uh, is taught in various disciplines and in area of discipline like sociology political science and philosophy and other what makes the study of uh, human rights by a law student distinct from the other disciplines well the idea is and in the basic notion that uh, uh, we tend to forget at times that when a law student tries to approach the idea of uh, human rights he is not analyzing the philosophy of human rights 
uh, a student of uh, law is trying to analyze the treaties that have incorporated the idea of human rights. So one of the pertinent features of uh, of uh, human rights are the treaties that have been made. So uh, if we are talking about international covenant on civil and political rights, we are not only discussing the idea of uh, the, the rights that have been incorporated, we are also trying to analyze the, uh, the concept of jurisdiction, intervention, so on and so forth. Now, the starting point of human rights, as far as international law is concerned, it did not gain any momentum until and unless individual came to be incorporated as a subject of international law. For me, this was the crucial point where the actual analysis of human rights in legal form started to gain momentum in international law. So, in order to gain a foothold in international law, it was necessary that the concept of subjects of international law had to go had to undergo a radical transformation and that included inclusion of individual as a subject of international law now it is from this point onwards that uh, the western legal tradition was able to dominate the narrative of uh, human rights at an international level because the conditions that gave birth to human rights were very cultural specific these conditions were prevalent in the, particularly in Western Europe and America, and that is the main reason why we tend to understand the narrative of uh, uh, human rights from from a Western perspective. Now, uh, the instant instant uh, uh, idea of incorporating individual as a subject of international law was a reaction against the Westphalian notion of state sovereignty. The concept of state sovereignty started undergoing a change after the outbreak of uh, First World War, where various scholars like uh, uh, Harsh Park, Hans Kelsen, George Shell, Hugo Grip, Hugo Grip, and Alfred Verdos, they started criticizing the monopolistic nature of sovereignty itself. Uh, state was not an end in itself. Now the ideas that came forward were that a state is not an abstract entity and it is ultimately it is the individuals that make up the state. And individuals as such have a, a priori existence as compared to states. Now this was a crucial point when we started analyzing individuals as the a priori standards of international law. Their existence previously, when only a state was uh, considered to be the subject of international law, only a state was supposed to have a legal personality. And this idea further strengthened by the decisions of Permanent Court of International Justice in the SS Lotus case and the very famous case of Mavro Matis. So now was the time to revise the conceptualization of subjects of international law. And the idea that now came forward that sovereignty itself was infallible. The sovereignty itself was not infallible. It was not perfect. It was not absolute. It was only a relative concept. Hans Kelsen always uh, emphasized on the idea that the ultimate point and the ultimate aim of international law were the individuals. And he popularized the idea that Technically speaking, sovereignty as such it does not reside in the states. Sovereignty as such resides in international law, so that all the other subjects could also uh, be strengthened. And as far as the relation between individual and state was concerned, uh, Hugo Grotius, uh, uh, Hans Kelsen followed the idea of Hugo Grotius and said that there, as such, there was no fundamental difference between the existence of a state and existence of an individual. This was a time period when the bridge between the public law and private law uh, uh, lessened and as such individual was seen to be the end of international, uh, the end of the state, not as a means for the state to be used. Now, this is also uh, an unknown uh, uh, explore, uh, unknown and uh, almost unexplored area that as far as Western Europe is concerned, the immediate political movement that helped human rights to gain momentum in international law was the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, Dreyfus Affair, where uh, a naval officer was falsely accused of sedition, this was a curious case where for the very first time we see 
two opposing interpretation of international law one school is backed by the german a uh, legal positivist school who are of the view that state is the ultimate destiny of international law a state is the only subject of international law and state sovereignty cannot be questioned it says it said that uh, only uh, states can be the subject of international law and at best individual can only be the object of international law not the subject of international law then on the other hand we had Uh, the school that supported the cause of uh, uh, Dreyfus affair, and this was led by uh, the French jurist uh, and French jurist because of the rich tradition of the French Revolution. They contrasted the they, they uh, uh, contrasted and debated with the German uh, positivist legal school and were of the view uh, that uh, individual was the center uh, of the international legal world, and uh, as such, it is the individual that is more important. uh then uh, then the state itself and this idea was propagated primarily by the french jurist leon duigi and leon duigi was arguably one of the initial scholars who were criticized the very idea of uh, uh, state sovereignty and uh duigi was of the view that it is very incorrect to conceive state as a mystical omnipotent entity there is a simple relation between state and the individual or a citizen whatever nomenclature you want to use he borrowed the terminology of august comte and said that the legal relation between the state and individual are pretty simple one who governs and one who is governed so in a way both of them have a legal status to uh, to a certain extent if we see some of the sources of international law then if we talk about the sources of international law then we are trying to view international law from the point of view of legal positivism now if we look at article 38 para 1 sub clause d then it says that the writing of the publicist are also uh, a source of international law so indirectly individuals are also uh, a source of international law but in my analysis the development of uh, uh, human rights did not developed primarily uh, primarily out of uh, the codification of international bill of human rights uh, the real idea of uh, uh, individuals being a subject of international law and as a result uh, individual gaining some amount of legal personality in international law was restricted to law of war and international humanitarian law if we look at uh, geneva convention third and article uh, article 7 if we look at the article 78 of geneva convention 3 uh, article 30 52 and 101 of uh, geneva convention number 4 individuals were given a, 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 a considerable amount of legal personality at least some duties of the state were fixed towards these uh, individual another Uh, uh, a striking uh, uh, example is that uh, for the very first time in the upper silesia tribunal individuals were given a locus standi the statute of international court of justice uh, disappointed some some people because uh, only states were given the locus standi under article 34 of statute of icj but the real breakthrough came in the formation of the nuremberg and tokyo trials and uh, nuremberg and tokyo trials are considered to be a, a starting point of uh, human rights treaties but we must not forget that uh, these uh, uh, these trials both nuremberg and uh, tokyo trial uh, these primarily talked about the duties of individual at an international level it wasn't addressing the cause of human rights directly and uh, uh, one of the uh, revolutionary thing that uh, nuremberg trial and uh, tokyo trial did was to lessen or uh, or to uh, sort of defertilize the idea of state sovereignty and uh, particularly uh, article 6 of nuremberg trial was instrumental in uh, in creating distinct offenses like for uh, the crime against peace war crimes and crime against humanity the uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, these laws were challenging the uh, notion of state sovereignty and for the very first time do we see that state sovereignty is not being this not only being uh, challenged at the same time a wrong use of sovereignty is also being penalized and that too with a death penalty 
the the novel idea that Nuremberg trial um, introduced was to make a, 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 a relatively new concept called uh, crime against peace. So uh, uh, declaring war against the allied powers was uh, uh, deemed to be an international crime. And uh, the people in their official and personal capacity uh, were prosecuted for it and even uh, they, and some of them were even awarded a, a death penalty. Similarly, the notion of war crimes and crime against humanity for the very first time in the most comprehensive manner were the duties of the states to where individuals were addressed. There was a thin red line between war crimes and crime against humanity. Uh, war crimes punished act of theft, theft rape, murder, uh, plundering or destroying houses by, uh, by the soldiers. And But crime against humanity uh, also tried to prosecute the officials who had uh, violated the human rights of the people prior to the outbreak of the uh, Second World War. Now, this was a, a very revolutionary step, but at the same time, the setting up of Nuremberg and Tokyo trials was heavily criticized, and uh, particularly, there was one Indian jurist whose name is easily forgotten in the annals of international law, that was Dr. Radha Binod Pal, and Radha Binod Pal gave his uh, dissenting opinion, a fam infamous, uh, rather infamous in dissenting opinion in the Tokyo trial, and he branded the Tokyo trials as a victor's justice. It was just another way to take revenge from the defeated parties. So uh, we can say that the checkered uh, history of uh, uh, human rights goes on to show that the development of human rights in the context of international law, it has not been a linear path. It has borrowed uh, 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 bits and pieces from uh, every concept of international law. So when we talk about um, incorporation of, uh, uh, when we see the introduction of human rights treaties, when we see human rights being, uh, being uh, developed through legal personality, we can see that human rights, which is a part and parcel of natural law philosophy, but in order to become a legal concept, it is heavily relying on the notion of, le uh, on, of uh, legal positivism. Now, uh, one of the, um, uh, do I have uh, uh, time or uh, should I continue? Yeah, I think you have exceeded 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Banu Pratap. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, I'll just need uh, two minutes to sum up my thoughts. Uh, actually, I had prepared a half an hour uh, lecture, but now I had to uh, cut it down. So uh, I'll try to do justice with the rest of the content. Uh, yeah. Uh, as far as uh, the development of uh, human rights is concerned, uh, again, uh, it took recourse to the treaty system uh, of international law. And uh, in, in today's uh, political uh, scenario, the notion of self-determination has gained uh, momentum. Uh, as far as International Court of Justice is concerned, in spite of having uh, a state-centric uh, jurisdiction, uh, International Court of Justice has made significant contribution in development of uh, human rights. And uh, one of the leading cases where uh, International Court of Justice uh, pondered over the idea of uh, human rights uh, was the Western Sahara states, uh, Western Sahara case. And in uh, the Western Sahara case, International Court of Justice gave a memorable uh, observation that it is the people who make up the territory and it is not the territory who make up the people. So uh, I think uh, it is at this point we clearly see a, 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 a clash between two concepts of that of state sovereignty and uh, human rights. And uh, uh, if human rights are to have a bright future, then the first thing that we have to compromise is the notion of uh, sovereignty. Sovereignty in its historical and legal concept has always been a, a relative concept. It's not absolute. It has always been divisible. But a brief interlude of uh, the 19th century legal positivism made state ev at times even bigger than individual. So uh, I think for, for, from the point of view of uh, legal research, uh, I think it's, it's high time that we start viewing uh, human rights all, uh, from the lens of uh, okay. legal positivism in order to gain a better understanding of the form of uh, human rights treaty. So that was my little contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Manu Pratap. Uh, on looking at the uh, human rights from the jurisprudential approach on the uh, positivism. So, uh, I have a, um, 
So what will you suggest uh, uh, for, for us to look uh, into? We know that human rights and sovereignty has always been in conflict because no, even though we have uh, a universal concept yep. of human rights, but it differs from countries to countries yep. to state to states. Yep. So how do you propose or how do you see these issues in futures? Uh, uh, see, uh, as you have uh, rightly observed, that uh, the concept of human rights uh, is a cultural phenomenon. And uh, the one thing that we have to understand as, uh, as, uh, as academicians and researchers and students of law, uh, we'll have to focus on the concept of sovereignty. And at the same time, we'll have to think of an alternate model uh, of governance. Because if sovereignty is to be compromised, then naturally we'll have to uh, look for an alternate political legal system that can be as viable and as efficient as um, as, as the state. Uh, uh, I don't know what what the uh, what the future lies, but um, uh, uh, I, I read uh, Hans Kelsen and uh, Hans Kelsen vision uh, in his book Peace Through Law, uh, where sovereignty has been divided among various international organizations who can become uh, in his vision can become more powerful than. The state. I think they, they, that is uh, one way out, or uh, otherwise we can work on a concept where sovereignty is to be divided among all the subjects of international law. Uh, let us not forget that uh, uh, all the subjects, be, in spite of being the subjects of international law, all subjects do not have the equal power. Individuals do not make treaties. So I think if we can uh, revisit and reconceptualize uh, the basic ideas of subjects of international law and, and uh, the confirmation of legal personality, I think we can. Uh, thank you, thank you, Manu. Now I invite the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Banu. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ankes Mori. Ankes Mori. Sir, sir, I'm here. Okay, sir, you just start your presentation. Yeah, Time is yes. 10 minutes. Yes, thank you.